really uh, individuals that accrue quite a bit of disability over a short period of time. And uh, the other end of the spectrum are people who live with Parkinson's for uh, ever, and they have Parkinson's that is managed reasonably well. Through it all, we say that they are all part of the same disease because Parkinson's is heterogeneous. So we figure if we say that, we're home free. So the way we think about Parkinson's is really based on forensic data. So essentially, we largely wait till somebody's dead to find out if what we said during life would reflect in the presence of aggregated proteins that we call Lewy bodies and Lewy pathology. We can potentially do other kinds of forensic approaches as patients are alive by doing biopsies, uh, by study, studying the, the cerebrospinal fluid, but all of these are largely experimental. We really are looking for the ashes left after the fire. And when we find anything relevant, then we essentially have two conclusions. Number one is we were right when that individual had symptoms, however unusual they may have been, that we clinicians refer to as Parkinson's disease. It was Parkinson's because look what we found. The second conclusion is actually the most damning of them all, which is I have found the cause of the fire. I have found the arsonist. You come into the crime scene and found the perpetrator of the crime is essentially what we do time and again what we see at the end of life on the ashes of the fire, we think must have created the fire with no evidence whatsoever from humans. Now, based on that idea, imagine that then we said, but we've defined Parkinson's that way. Why would we reinvent it? Why would we have to kind of change it? Well, it's actually not that difficult to argue because if you have Parkinson's, in particular these studies, 213 brains of people who had bad kind of Parkinson's, uh, Parkinson's disease, dementia, and dementia of bodies ended up dying, confirmed that they had Parkinson's pathology. The study was done for something else, for the study of a rule called the one-year rule, that if you have symptoms of dementia prior to a year after the symptom onset, you would be referred to as the menstrual Lewy bodies. If it is after, you would be referred to as Parkinson's disease dementia. And the study essentially showed this is not really a good rule. It doesn't pan out well. But what allowed us to ask is, what is the chance of having a second presumably unrelated disease if you have Parkinson's? And we think that as we age, the chance of us having another condition of course, goes up just because we're aging. And do we say, is it 15%, 20% perhaps the chance of having a second unrelated disease? Well, this study shows that if you just look at the mild level of Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's would co-occur with Parkinson's 26%. If to that you add the intermediate severity of Alzheimer's pathology, then you have 21%. And if you have this severe pathology, that's another 30%. So if you're counting here, you're approaching 80% of people who have been confirmed on pathology to have what we said they had, who also on pathology happen to have the evidence of what we refer to as Alzheimer's disease. Should we tell individuals that we are at the bedside diagnosis, diagnosing as Parkinson's disease that they should expect Alzheimer's eight times out of 10 because Parkinson's is an unlucky disease? Or should we consider that what has been driving, that ultimately let, what, what drives the disease in an individual happens to give rise to pathologies, to changes in autopsy that we happen to classify as two separate diseases. 
by virtue of our current understanding. Because ours is referred to as a clinical pathologic model. You have a variety of clinical features and on pathology, you have Lewy bodies. Then there are many different types of genetic and molecular forms of Parkinson's that have come to be identified. And this figure here belongs to a scientific paper that essentially used very sophisticated analytics to put together into the same puzzle. And this actual puzzle is in the, in the figure of the paper, all the different abnormalities that have been reported to be associated with or cause Parkinson's disease. And if you look at this, you would have to conclude that there is literally no part of the cellular machinery that is spared from the ravages of the disease. That so this disease is really attacking the cell in every possible aspect. And of course, if I'm at a pharmaceutical company, I can say, ooh, wow, just about any drug that works in any of these different mechanisms could work and we can use it into clinical trials, right? And that's why we become excited about different molecules because just about any kind of approach for mitochondrial enhancement, for anti-apoptosis, for alpha-synucleomic misfolding, all the stuff that you see in this slide is exciting and we have therapies for it. And that's why we have so many tombstones. So this concept of Parkinson's as a puzzle is an interesting analogy. We essentially think truly as a puzzle. We think that we are finding the pieces that are kind of connecting one to another. And all we have to define is how many other pieces before we complete the puzzle. And when we look closely to the pieces, we want to think that they are really nicely fitting together, when in fact they really aren't. We were to look at this from a completely different vantage point. In fact, rather than seeing this as a puzzle, it may well be that we're dealing with several puzzles. They may be related to each other, but in fact, have a lot of independence. And that independence is important for us to acknowledge because you would think that they would require different therapeutic approaches. That if I have a therapy that works in a different molecular pathway, that individuals that have the molecular subtype would be best suited for benefiting from those therapies and not others. But that's not what we do. What we do instead is that we have all these different molecular pathways, and I have sort of separated out the pieces of the puzzle here. And what we look for is the stuff that is common across them all. We look for what is convergent. We have Lewy bodies, as I've mentioned to you, and dopamine deficiency. And that is the definition of reductionism, whereby the whole is nothing but the sum of its parts. I've told you already, by the way, that it is not the case that our model of Parkinson's should have pure Lewy bodies, pure synuclein aggregation. In fact, and I can sh uh, show you lots of data, but I'll, I won't do it in this case. That's the exception. And in fact, that's why you saw that according to the way we define diseases, we would have to say that if Parkinson's can only apply to a pathology of Lewy bodies, then we have to admit that 80% of those of us who develop Parkinson's will develop Alzheimer's, which would be kind of silly. Because of the way we do this, and of course, we're thinking that any abnormality that happens to segregate with a specific uh, molecular pathway would be reported in the, in the literature as we always do, we scientists as uncovering new target for therapeutic development in Parkinson's disease, because it sounds incredibly sexy every time that we discover something in a specific family that we make it look as if it can work on everyone. Because it 
it is not as sexy to say we've uncovered a novel therapeutic target for the development of therapies for that individuals and for those that have the same genetic molecular combination. So that in this model, if we have something that happens to work for that particular pathway, what we end up doing is, of course, a clinical trial that will target everyone not just those that are most likely to benefit, but everyone, because we think that what we're learning from some will apply to all, that the pieces of the puzzle are part of a single puzzle. Because of the way that we define Parkinson's and we define clinical symptoms, and that is what defines the disease. Remember that the way we diagnose Parkinson's is by looking at the bedside in, in a number of different features and then saying, all right, well, this and this and this checks in my mental check boxes of the criteria for Parkinson's and individuals don't have this, that, and this other feature that would tell us that something else is happening. Therefore, it must be Parkinson's. And not only that, we think that there is a tremor and a tremorless form of Parkinson's. That becomes the gold standard. Then we measure a variety of different things and we look for statistical correlations of what groups with one versus the other. And this is the model that we use for biomarker development. We just say that we're finding biomarkers, but of the stuff that is considered the truth. We have set up the, the truth by saying, this is Parkinson's number one. Not only that, this is tremor dominant Parkinson's because we're that sophisticated. But in fact, if you look at the data and I'm not gonna really belabor this point is that the studies are showing not only a big deal of uh, overlap when you look at potential signals of interest between people with Parkinson's and without Parkinson's, even within Parkinson's, uh, but you could imagine that none of this would ever tell us of a future in which we could use any of these pathology markers that were studying as potential biomarkers to identify individuals in the future that might have a very unusual, very unique disease that we can target in a specific way that we aren't already. So the reason we keep failing and keep accruing tombstones is because the treatments that we are developed or have developed over the last four decades are never matched to those most likely to respond. We need to understand that if we're gonna use an intervention in anyone, there is a mechanistic proof of susceptibility of the intervention to the recipient. We need divergence biomarkers. That is biomarkers that are gonna tell us about individuals that are unique to others, that are gonna be present in some, but absent in most. Now that is what would require, that we essentially need to match the what to the who, and that's what cancer therapies have done. And by the way, that is what most other fields of medicine have done. And if we think in that way, we, we can envision a future in which clinical trials won't be hundreds or thousands of patients, but smaller, tens of patients, which much better defined characteristics so that then we could imagine a, a future in which therapies will begin to start slowing down smaller subtypes of disease. This is, by the way, what we would propose. And in fact, what we've been doing is that we are accruing a large aging cohort. And rather than saying, we're going to put names to those that are in the cohort, which of course we are anyhow, because we are providing diagnostic labels, except that we're not using them for biomarker development. Instead, we're looking at the signals themselves and then finding who those individuals are. What I showed you earlier was called phenotype-driven biomarker development, meaning that the phenotype, the diagnosis that we create at the bedside becomes the standard against which to validate biomarkers. This is different. This is the biology driving the subtypes and therefore allowing us to define who among those in the universe of Parkinson's would be best suited for specific therapies that would alter the abnormalities in biology that those individuals have. Because if you look back at that puzzle and think about all these different people that we're 
recruiting to studies, in fact, they might segregate into different subtypes, of course, if we only knew who they were, and there might already be therapies available. That is precision medicine, and we don't have it. We don't have it in our uh, world of Parkinson's. So this is the introduction. Briefly, this is the only slide about what we're doing in Cincinnati. Uh, is a large uh, phenotype agnostic that is blinded to clinical diagnosis, patients aging with Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and other conditions. And we are then deploying bioassays rather than measuring the proteins that accumulate in individuals at death, which we don't think are going to tell us much about the cause of the disease. We're in fact uh, developing bioassays of therapies already available so that we can think who they can be repurposed to. And imagine that a future, it will be again fewer subjects as I mentioned uh, earlier, but better characterized biologically. Now, from a global perspective, we need to be prepared to the idea that the first success may only apply to one to 2% of patients with Parkinson's and to no one else. Now that is, a cultural shift that will require reinventing Parkinson's because right now we insist that we're going to cure Parkinson's and unless we change that irrational hope into the rational hope that is to begin to tease out to cure subtypes however small they may be one at a time as other fields of medicine have done then and only then we'll be able to make progress. And I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to stop sharing, and I hope uh, into that uh, you found that helpful. And I, of course, ho also hope that this is resonating in our community of patients. As I started at the beginning, we yeah. neurologists are incredibly uh, traditionalist, and we think we're on the right path because we're the smartest species on the planet but we're not in the right path. We are one of the two fields of medicine, neurology and psychiatry that insist that we all along have known what diseases that we call by different names are. And unless we change that and begin to think in a biological fashion, we will not make progress. Yeah, that's a very different way of thinking. Thank you, Alberto. Um, that was really a beautiful lecture and I love your slides. So so colorful and interactive. Um, so just to break it down a little bit more simply, so just because I think that, um, you know, I think the audience may just want to hear a few takeaways and correct me if I'm wrong. So it sounds like what you're saying is that the patients that we've defined, so there's tons and tons of symptoms. So some people are having tremors, some people are having more stiffness and slowness, some people have gait issues. There's a really varied group of patients out there and we're defining um, Parkinson's by the end marker, which is something that we see when we cut the brains of Parkinson's patients. And we see that Lewy body in the brain, in the substantia nigra, so that black substance in the brain stem, that's the end point that we're seeing of um, possibly many different reasons for getting that sort of end point on a microscope. And because we've defined it as that endpoint, just like Alzheimer's is defined as a, a different endpoint with different proteins that look differently on a microscope, we sort of have this sense um, because we're sort of taking the endpoint, the ashes, as you said, in the crime scene. And we're trying to kind of think about what were all the things that led to that crime. Um, and if we took 100 crime scenes, the sense is that there should all be the same crime with the same arsonist because we're seeing the same ashes, but really we should be looking for many different criminals, many different ways of lighting the fire, many different things that were lit on fire to look at the ashes at the end. Um, and so we really have to think about all of these different things and maybe sometimes an overlapping, you know, um, group of uh, things that were set on fire and people involved and things, if we're using that analogy, which I think really has re resonated with people. Um, you know, to sort of see how can we make a difference to prevent, you know, the, the flame or whatever in, in the first place in these different populations. And so as we've seen in certain diagnoses like cancer, where we're finding certain markers, like sometimes it's a gene marker, sometimes other blood tests that we're able to say, are you positive, let's say in breast cancer for this receptor, 
Um, and then we target specific treatments to those specific things that are either genes or other reasons um, in, in this population. And that there could be a number of reasons why um, you know, these things could all end up in flames. But we have, we've been looking for one reason to prevent the flames. It should really be a, a much more broader approach. Correct. Is that sort of the yeah. analogy? Okay. And, and it's so much, it would be so much nicer if we could really have this figured out, right? If, if it could be one disease, wouldn't it be nice? We could aim at curing this disease, but it isn't one disease. It's a beautiful idea. It's a great concept. It's hopeful and it is not real. And so it, it, every other field of medicine has done this. Now I wanted to, you, you said everything absolutely correct and I'm keep on trying to remind everyone that this discussion is meaningful if we're looking at disease modifying therapies. This is not applicable to symptomatic therapies. We've done reasonably well. And for symptomatic therapies, uh, it doesn't matter to divide as much. We can lump, but for disease modifying strategies, we have to split. Because when patients ask us, Doctor, what is my what why did I have Parkinson's? Why why did it happen? Why did it what happened to me that I developed Parkinson's? The answer is we don't know, right? But if we were to ever know the answer for that person, the answer would not be the same to the next person's Parkinson's. It'd be unlikely to be the same, right? If we're talking about we know that what's common among people is that they do not make enough dopamine. But why that happened, the answer to that is going to be unique to individuals. So splitting for that purpose is going to be critical because we might, that's the only way to find out the subtypes within which we can intervene. Okay. So when we're talking about symptomatic. Um, what Alberto means is that we have a symptom. So we have, let's say, stiffness and we give Cinemet, like a dopamine to give replacement for a chemical that's missing, we can use symptomatic treatment and we have good symptomatic treatment and even the surgeries can help, especially in the motor realm. But when we think about what those cell, what, why those cells are not happy and what's happening to them over a period of time, um, that's really sort of where we're talking about the words like um, disease modification and neuroprotection. Um, we had Tanya Samuni on earlier in the series and she kind of defined to us a little bit about what she thought those words meant because there's been so much change sometimes in, in the way that we even as, as researchers and doctors have thought about some of these words. So, so Alberto, could you define for us um, what you think speaks to you about neuroprotection versus disease modification? Yeah, uh, neuroprotection requires technically that we define that cells are being preserved, are protected and in reality, in humans, we cannot do that. And that's part of the reason why we use the term disease modification, because uh, we cannot really prove neuroprotection. So the two categories of therapeutic development are symptom improvement. They are mostly going to be to enhance that which is not being produced much. Dopamine is one, right? Dopamine strategies are the most important, but there is therapies for norepinephrine enhancement, another neurotransmitter, acetylcholine enhancement, another neurotransmitter, serotonergic enhancement, another neurotransmitter. These are all common denominators. So that's symptomatic therapies. Then on the other end is disease modification. Disease modification requires targeting a specific molecular pathways. They may not have any symptomatic effect. They may not help a tremor. They may not help a, a cognitive difficulty. They may not help the rate of falls initially, but if you take them over time, they would change the natural course of the, of the disease. They would slow it down. The definition of a disease modifying strategy is that the effects are present well beyond the molecule is present in blood so that the effects persist. Whereas in symptomatic therapies, pretty much the effects are gonna be present only while the therapy is active in blood. You stop taking the therapy, the, ben the benefits go away. That's a symptomatic improvement. So far, we have zero gains on disease modification because we've used the same approach. We think that symptom therapy and disease modification therapies are kind of part of the spectrum that if we do well here, we can kind of apply the same principles 
for disease modification. Those are two very different animals. And provided that we continue thinking about them in the same way we've been for four decades, we'll continue to have zero successes in disease modification. Um, so I'm just going to read you a couple of the comments. Uh, so Diana writes, um, although I'm not a, so she wrote, uh, I'm so glad to hear a researcher finally talking about this. And her second comment was, although I'm not a researcher, I've said this exact thing about the changes in cancer treatment and how I believe we need to approach Parkinson's disease. Um, some of the symptomatic therapies are actually doing a lot of damage was her, was her comment. Um, and then there, so it sounds like people are interested in your approach. Um, then Winters writes, um, disease modifying therapies means a therapy that slows progression, right? And I think you clarified that a second ago, but then um, doesn't exercise pres pre preserve cells was the question. Yeah, so exercise, we say we have zero disease modification strategies. I, I would have to add the exception of, of exercise. Exercise is probably going to be the only thing that can be disease modified because exercise has a way of mo changing molecules in individuals. And the, even if two persons do the same type of exercise, they're going to have molecular changes that are unique to each. So exercise really ends up eliciting a variety of different changes, molecularly speaking, that are applicable to the individual that's exercising. So it's actually precision medicine. And, and in fact, what most companies are trying to do is trying to kind of harness the benefit of exercise into a capsule that will work for everyone. It would be a great idea, but it cannot work. And therefore, to truly disease modify your own condition, you have to exercise. So sweating and panting still represents an important uh, uh, strategy for disease modification. All right, that's good. Because we talk a lot about that in the series, along with a, a bunch of other lifestyle sort of um, approaches that I think are kind of global, like sleep and um, mind-body approaches and you know nutrition and things like that, that are kind of, I think, you know, we even um, some of the literature now on Alzheimer's disease um, there's this analogy, you bring the fire one, um, I've heard an analogy with Alzheimer's of a, a roof that's leaky, and there might not just be one hole, there might be multiple different sort of defects in the roof and sort of targeting different things possibly with some of these different approaches um, on a practical level, I think for patients right now um, is still to me makes a lot of sense. Maybe you could speak to that. Uh, yes, I think in general, uh, even though I, I'm not an expert on this area, I think you are an expert in that you should speak on this, uh, in fact, for me. Um, I, I, I think there is so much that can be accomplished. In fact, uh, tell me about your approach, because I, 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 I think uh, your approach is probably gold standard for me. Tell me okay. about it. Well, that would be amazing. Thank you for switching the table, turning the tables here. Ah. Up We're going to come back to you very momentarily, but I think most people understand my approach. My approach is very much about um, staying uh, from day of diagnosis, uh, staying positive, empowering yourself through the things that you have control over. So the things like that you can modify. So getting a good night's sleep, the kinds of things that all of all of us as doctors are supposed to be doing too, you know, eating, uh, you know, whole food, plant-based, uh, if possible, Mediterranean diets, hydration, um, exercise. If we can get an hour in a day, more is better. Social connection is something that I don't think any of us have really thought about very much historically, but something that I'm spending a lot of time and energy thinking about more as we're talking about COVID. So all of these things I think are kind of a lifestyle um, approach that makes a lot of sense when you think about these holes in the roof analogy. And I, I do actually know, I've been keeping up with the Alzheimer's literature. I go to meetings on some of these approaches as well. And a lot of this is very similar with many neurodegenerative diseases, um, you know, sleep, exercise, um, and, and then even things like mindfulness and meditation, yoga, things like that, that can really sort of, um, you know, uh, slow down thoughts and, and, and sort of move more internally to help with some of these uh, um, neurodegenerative diseases I think can be very valuable. So, so, and, and I don't think any of them cause any harm as well. And they're generally pretty free. So um, if we can, you know, kind of prescribe something that's relatively uh, um, cheap and not necessarily easy, sometimes it requires a frame shift of thought. But I think in the meantime, while we're trying to customize all these um, 
approaches uh, with your populations. I think I think it's all very um, important to to find ways that every day our patients can try to empower themselves while while we're meeting people on the series like you, Alberto, who are you know passionate and trying to shift the frame of thinking. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you, so, you know, you've been, um, we're probably about the same vintage in terms of being um, in practice, and it sounds like you've been in practice for a while and really thought about these things, you know, long and hard as to why we haven't succeeded, and you're bringing this um, novel concept back to our um, community. I know you have a, a book also that I'd like you to speak about for a second um, as well that's uh, going to be hot off the presses soon. Um, and I just want to find out what's your sense of how the movement disorders community has accepted these theories. And I know you you are very passionate and enjoy actually um, the uh, I, I, debates. I, sh I should say um, that you you've had with you know you you described some with your mentor and other folks. So maybe you could just describe sort of the the climate in which you're you're feeling this approach being accepted by our community and and possibly you know, teaching us a little bit about the book. And then I'd like to speak a little bit about what our patients can practically do from your approach as well right now. Sure. So uh, the answer to the need for reinventing Parkinson's uh, has been uh, very much lukewarm so far. Now, it, it is a better level than it was earlier. The earlier was uh, complete crazy idea and uh, and I think uh, uh, the arguments that we're doing we're leveraging now that are publishing on are based on data that we'll have and it's quite remarkable when you start analyzing data already published already available for analysis but without the urge to validate your hypothesis. You just look at the data and you emerge with a different mindset altogether. I'm gonna give you an example because I think it's a simple one. If a group of people, and it's been done, are asked to not sleep one night and they are examining their brains, uh, they are compared on the first day after, of course, normal sleep, their brains are imaged for amyloid. Amyloid is the protein that aggregates in Alzheimer's, just like Lewy bodies is a protein that aggregates predominantly in Parkinson's. The very next day after a sleep deprived night, the pet will be positive. There will be plenty of amyloid in the brain. The conclusion of the, of the paper with this study is sleep deprivation is the cause, it can be a cause of Alzheimer's. Right, because you only sleep one night, you accumulate proteins, amyloids, and therefore that's it. You're on the way to developing Alzheimer's. And it turns out that another explanation, with without you having any of the mindsets, right, that that amyloid should equal Alzheimer's, is that when you have any kind of injurious behavior to your brain, sleep deprivation would be one of them your brain reacts against it by aggregating amyloid. And in fact, if you sleep again, fine, and then do another PET scan of your brain, that's gonna be gone. So nothing about that data set will tell you that the brain is doing anything other than reacting to an injury. The injury was not sleeping. Your brain kind of got this uh, extra protein and then you sleep well and then it went away. And then it went away. And that examples like that are, bond, but, uh, are abundant, but uh, the interpretation we have of those is that all these things are causes of Alzheimer's. So, so the, the, the second point you ask is one that I've realized somebody, somebody privately asked me, how is this helpful now? Why would it be helpful to, to think about this now? And I'm going to tell you, why by uh, actually switching again to another slide, so just a, a few slides, if that's okay with you, Indu, I'll, I'll just show you. Yeah, um, we have a lot of questions, Alberto. You might have okay. to come back on. No, but you could do the slides, do the slides, go okay. for it. This is, uh, can, can you see this? Yep. Uh, okay, so no, this is, hold on a second. No, that's not it. It's gonna be this one right here. And I just briefly wanted to show you this, which uh, 
uh, is it the reason why it's important for all of us to be on the same on the same board. Now, believe it or not, people may not know this, but there are there have been 35 trials on Alzheimer's. Now, typically, a trial is designed to test a hypothesis. If the hypothesis is positive, they or the trial is positive, the hypothesis is confirmed. If the if the hypothesis or the trial is negative, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, if, if the trial leads to nowhere, then the hypothesis should be rejected. But that's not how we operate in neurology. In neurology, we like to think that we really know what we're talking about. And if a trial is negative, we think the problem is the trial. Now, these are the 35 trials published in Alzheimer's, all of them negative. Now, nearly 70% of them have actually shown that the therapists have done what the therapists were meant to do which is to reduce uh, or eliminate the amyloid in the brain, right? Which we're doing now for therapies for Parkinson's disease to eliminate or reduce the alpha synuclein aggregate. Now, truly no results are 59, 60% of, this, of these trials. But the reason it's important to look at the data in detail is because 30% or so are patients who worsened on the treated arm compared to placebo. And they worsen either by deteriorating in cognition, by having worse dementia, or by, ex or by uh, shrinking their brain further, or both. Now, the explanation has been, well, the problem is that when we, treat, when we treat patients with Alzheimer's, we're treating them too late. We need to treat them earlier. Well, if you look at the earlier, meaning prodromal Alzheimer's, these are people that don't have Alzheimer's as we define it yet. They have something called mild cognitive impairment. Of the six that have been done, three of them have shown a shorter time to dementia and an increase in the atrophy of the brain. So I'm stopping that again. And I want to ask you if you feel that you would be a great candidate, if I were your doctor, to tell you that I in my center have an antibody therapy against alpha synuclein. Would you participate in that trial? Do you guys want to do a poll? You guys can do the poll function. I don't know, Anissa, are you, do you know much about that? I'm not the queen of that. They actually can do a poll on this, which we've had answers to before. That would be um, or raise your hand. Raise your hand. Would you, if, if any doctor tells you that there is an antibody against alpha synuclein, would you participate in the trial? Now, remember that I've, based on all the data you've seen, so how many of you will participate? Three uh, out of- I think, yeah, I think. well, there's, there's like 180 people, 170 people on here, some of which we don't see the video of, but, but I think I'm seeing about maybe 20% okay. at least. 20%, all right. So what if I tell you based on the data that as we've seen with Alzheimer's, it is just as likely that the approach to destroy the protein in uh, Parkinson's is going to play out just the same as in Alzheimer's. You will either have no benefit or be worse. No benefit or be worse. Now, here's where you play out because this is why it's important to know this stuff because we are asking patients to participate in trials that are hopeful because we think that they will in fact bring on a cure. They have no chance of bringing a cure, zero chance of bringing a cure. And 40% chance, if we use the data from Alzheimer's, 40% chance of harming. And this is why it's important that you know this because we are not keen to change. Dr. Subramanian asked me, how is the field taking this? The field doesn't like this because there are many conflicts of interest, because money speaks. And because in my center, by me not participating in any of these clinical trials, we are suffering financially, right? But I refuse to think that this is a game of money. And I can no longer offer any of these studies to patients because it doesn't matter how much they pay. I cannot take the money and say, cross my fingers and hope that you're gonna be in the people that will not be harmed but it's up to you to carry this message out because nobody else will do it. We won't do it. In fact, we're interested in inviting you to these trials. 
we want you to participate because there is money that we stand to make by you participating in these trials. So you are very critical and very important to, to spread this message. These trials must end. Now, Promisingly, what we've been looking at is the following. It's just fascinating. And this is the beautiful positive side of continuing to question what is it and what is, what is it true and what is not true. So if all of us are aggregating proteins as we age, and all we see on autopsy is these clumps of proteins, where does that come from? Well, it turns out that those proteins, according to biophysic experiments, are coming from our functioning proteins. So all proteins in the brain to function normally must be soluble, must be very small and very soluble. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna take advantage of the flexibility here and show you what I mean by that. So proteins are essentially kind of like this, right? And what happens is uh, that when the brain proteins are normally, they do all their good stuff, but if they encounter something that shouldn't be there, this is what they do. And they are no longer functioning. They have undergone a transformation that is physical from soluble to insoluble, that is biological from functioning to non-functioning. This protein right here, is gone, cannot do any function. But guess what? This is what we find in the ashes of the fire. And we say, oh, we found the culprits. This is what caused the fire. So we need to destroy it. So we just completed analysis of the large data set of an uh, study. And ask the question, most of us get to this point when we are in our 70s. Most of us have lots of this stuff in our brains. 50% of us without dementia have this, without dementia. 25% of us with Parkinsonism have Lewy bodies without, uh, or, or, have Parkinsonism without Lewy bodies and vice versa, have Lewy bodies without Parkinsonism. Turns out that this is not that relevant once it's in this, because it's, it's solid and non-functioning. It cannot be toxic, even though that, that's how we're treating it, it's toxic. So we ask a question, if we determine everybody who has proteins aggregates already in the brain. Now, the only way we can measure that is through PET. We have a PET that allows us to determine the extent to which we have a lot of amyloid in our brains. What's the difference between people who aggregate, who develop dementia versus not don't, those who don't, that already, that already have these aggregates in the brain? That difference is how much of this stuff is there? How much of this stuff is there? People who have above a certain threshold, no matter how much of this they have, but if they have a certain threshold of the soluble stuff, do great. People who have very little of this and mostly everything is this now, they are the ones who develop dementia. Develop dementia. So the future might in fact be, at least in the first layer of disease modification, not quite precision medicine, but rescue medicine, to replenish the proteins that we're losing to aggregating forces. Not to destroy the proteins that already are doing nothing because they are tombstones themselves. They are just solid fragments of the protein, the functioning soluble proteins they were. But it would be to infuse proteins that are functioning in a soluble state that hopefully will not aggregate. So a, a less aggregating form of the, the proteins that are, have now become solid, stable, that are the, the plaques and the Lewy bodies that we worry about. That rather than antibodies against the proteins might in fact be the future. And that's what we're working uh, with colleagues from uh, Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, because in fact, it, it, is, it is the most sensical approach to replenish that which we're losing rather than destroying that which is no longer doing anything for us. This already approach in diabetes, diabetes has insulin and insulin aggregates into nodules. When insulin injected aggregates into nodules, our approach is not to, to de-aggregate the nodules, it's to change the needle and move it, move it elsewhere. 
and 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 the, in fact the way to to deliver insulin very much could well be the way in which we will end up delivering the proteins that our brains need so it's an exciting time to rethink to reinvent parkinson's because it could have very important implications for our future but me meanwhile it is critical for that patients and patient advocates recognize that the way forward cannot be doing the same that we've done. And people say, well, we're not doing the same. We have been changing the molecules, but not the approach. So we have been doing the same for decades and it has to change. Wow. Um, Alberto, you're doing like a puppet show with the blanket. <laughs> it's all like <laughs> real time. So I really do hope that we look back on this video, which will be on YouTube. And Anissa, um, if you could make sure that we give people, like people are asking in the chat how to get all the videos. Um, we can make sure we, we give them that link because I, I think it would be helpful and maybe email everybody how to get this easily. Because I think there's been a real hunger for, especially the last series of talks, people are um, wanting the actual YouTube videos because these are quite out of the box and really need, need another view or two of, you know, just digesting everything that's been said. But um, Alberto, we have four minutes. I want you to tell us about your book because that's something that you've really worked hard on and I know it's coming very yeah. soon and I'm excited to have people read it and understand more because this is a very complex area. And also just maybe give um, a, uh, a, a, just a sentence or two, sort of a final, you know, practical something that you would tell a patient today that they could do one to advocate that's practical, like, you know, call this number or, you know, something, you know, because we've talked a lot about about sort of the theory. And then number two, you know, just in terms of what your global advice, you know, as I summarize for you about any Parkinson's patient, maybe just, you know, something that's quite pra one practical tip that you really, you know, found that resonates with patients. All right, I'll try in four minutes. So Brain Fables is a book that uh, will describe the key stories of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, how we came to think of each of these diseases, and we'll go through each of the important milestones of our knowledge, and then present the data that created the milestones to, to view the data from what it is, uh, a completely different story. And the argument that is made is that all of these stories, however compelling and logical they are, do not make sense in biology. And, and so it's, uh, and by the way, what I just mentioned with my, my little uh, representation here of the proteins that transform, that's not in the book, that's part of the epilogue because that came to be a little later. So it's sort of, in a sense, uh, the book ends on a cliffhanger and that cliffhanger is what's to come uh, mm -hmm. on in terms uh, of, of the potential for a rescue <laughs> medicine for Parkinson's, which we think could be within us in two to three years. Um, what one thing you could say is every time somebody tells you, give me your money so that we can cure Parkinson's, ask again, cure what? Cure who? Ask the who, the who more often. When a therapy sounds good for Parkinson's, ask who would that therapy be good for? Because there's a lot of a lot of people, a lot of foundations that like to claim they cure Parkinson's if you give them money. It's not possible. Parkinson's will never be cured. But small subtypes of Parkinson's will. And a cure might be in the future if we begin to think in little pieces. And then I fully agree with Indu about the importance of attitude and a motivation and exercise. There is something biologically positive about the attitude. We are who we think we are. It, we are self-fulfilling prophecies. And in a sense, if we see ourselves with a future ahead of us and doing all sorts of different things and do those things, uh, those it turns out that we leave that promise. I, shortly after my training, realized that I knew so much. And people could ask me, what's my future? What's the prognosis, right? And I think, oh, based on all we, you can think, this is how you would expect to, to do. And I realized how little of that I actually now know because the wild card in everyone's future is 
what you think. What you think and, of course, what you do. But what you think is so critical. And I found people that I thought that they were, they had only two or three years to leave. And I was super wrong. They live forever. <laughs> they died of something completely unrelated, really. With Parkinson's, but not of Parkinson's. And then conversely, people that I thought would have really a great future. But they thought that life was coming to an end. They just couldn't buy into anything good about that diagnosis. So they proved themselves correct. They became self-fulfilling prophecies. So thinking is critical. And uh, if you think positively and, and do the exercise and do the diet, you're going to be, you're going to be doing terrific. And so that then what is for us to do is to work together in truly rethinking everything we know about Parkinson's so that then we can make progress for everyone, not just in our minds, but for, for actual people. Well, thank you so much, Alberto. I thank you for your enthusiasm, your infectious laugh, which I always look forward to hearing when you present. Um, and, uh, you know, for just thinking outside the box. Um, and I think, you know, the advocacy part of things is just so key. And we've really been bringing that to this um, group and the empowerment. So I think, you know, again, thinking positively, you know, doing the things in your day-to-day -day life that you're able to control, um, you know, to make a better, you know, sort of future for yourselves as, as our patients. And what I'm hoping to bring to you in this series is just the wealth of amazing personalities that are out there that are trying to fight this fight on a daily basis and do the research and really make a difference for our patients and their caregivers out there. So hopefully you're seeing that in the, in the smiling faces of some of our our lecturers and just the enthusiasm. So thank you again, um, Alberto, for taking the time out of your busy schedule and for all the things you're advocating for. And thank you, PMD Alliance, for having us again. Um, and uh, we'll continue some great talks. I'm just really excited. And maybe we'll have Tony Lang on. I'd love to hear what his take is on this as well. That'll be, that'll be great. He's going to trash everything <laughs> I've said. <laughs> all, right, we'll... <laughs> all right, we'll see. We'll see. You can be a guest as well. You can you can be a quiet. Uh, he a quiet might, uh, He and I might strangle each other, but uh, no, no, we love we love each other. We love each other very much. That's cute. <laughs> All right, back to you, Anissa. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Espe. Thank you again, Dr. Subramanian, and thank you to everyone that joined us today. So as we exit, if everyone wants to give us our wave goodbye wave back to our wonderful host and our speaker today thank you so much and we will see you again all right bye